Hello and welcome to the Gallant Few Rangers podcast. My name is Mason Stewart and I'll be your host this evening. And it's Premier League time. Um, again, I feel like I say this every time, but it's just always so much to get through when we get we get through these games. But with me tonight, we have Jamie. How are you, Jamie? Yeah, thanks for having me back on, Mason. Yep, absolutely fine. Um, Liverpool still kicking on as we see the, the shall we say, the, the one that nobody's talking about. So uh, I'm happy. Yeah, win. I think I think another week where we've, we, our teams have played and won, so that's a good start. Um, and also we've got Colin. How are you, Colin? I'm good, Mason. Um, hello, Jamie. Hello, listeners. I'm back in love with football and looking forward to talking about all things EPL. Yeah, and, and, and let's get right into it then, boys. Um, Jamie, let's start with Friday night. Uh, Palace won uh, Spurs 2. Spurs absolutely flying. Um it was it was it was not their best performance first half. I thought they're in trouble here, um, but Palace didn't really offer a lot. Um, but let's start with with, with Spurs. Then, what, what did you make of, of, of them on, on Friday? I think same old. Into it. it's 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 the Madison and Son show. When them two are clicking, they 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 were obviously pulling out these results. Um, I'm like you. I don't think they played very good at all for the first half, and they seemed very. Um, it's like. What, trying to watch for Tolson, he's like he's like a square peg in a round hole, isn't he? He just doesn't seem to be fitting properly. So it comes back to Son and uh, Madison to try and change it. The way it was panning out, I thought it would have been a draw because Palace are very well known for kind of hanging those ones out and, and sneaking a draw out the back of it. But Joel Wood, with the, the own goal, was probably criminal defending to not only, not only shin the ball, that's fired across your box, but to shin it with your wrong foot, meaning that it comes, it, the only way it can go is directly at your goal, kind of summed up their performance come the first 70 minutes, 80 minutes. Um, and I think when they when they went 1-0 up, just one-way traffic then, wasn't it? I think it was only when, and this is the bit that probably I keep talking about, is that the moment Ange started to change this Tottenham team and move people around, they started to lose control of the game and, and Palace had the last 10 minutes. Um, you could probably argue if they had another 10 minutes, they might have got an actual equaliser out of it because Tottenham were very hanging on at the end. But you can only beat what's in front of you and this is this is kind of what they've been doing all season. Um, so another good win for them, setting pretty at the top. It is, a really, you know, as you said, a really good start. 26 points they're taking out of 30. Now, that's, that's ridiculous. Great start. Um, Colin... Just, just to flip that, um, Palace again another defeat. I thought they were for, for the home team. I thought they were really poor. I didn't really look like scoring, and, and obviously got a late one in the end. Um, but the question I'm going to ask you is, what did you make of Roy Hodgson's comments after the game about the, the substitution, and, and especially, you know, on the young younger players? I thought it was a little bit. I, I'm surprised by it, to be honest. Yeah, no. Well, on Hodgson, first of all, um, I don't know, I think once you get to a certain age, then you just kind of stop giving a fuck a wee bit, don't you? Um, he's there, um, he's, uh, he's there to do the, the day-to-day groundwork on the training pitch and on the, and on the game. Um, I think the more he goes on, the, the less he cares about the media. Um, on Palace itself, I don't know, Mason, I, I I thought they played well the first half. Um, again, I, I don't know if it's maybe what you and Jamie are saying, well, Spurs were poor the first half or Palace were good. It might, it might have made Palace look a wee bit, you know, a wee bit prettier, but I thought they'd done okay and they were in the game up until the second half and I thought it's their own fault that they brought Spurs back in there. I, I don't think Spurs were the free phone best, which we've watched all the club about them um, time and time again on this podcast, but they weren't just chapping at the door constantly. I don't think as much as they would have done. It looked as if they were beginning to run out of steam. The goalkeeper for Paris, Jesus Christ, man. Like, I, every time I'm on it, on this podcast, another goalkeeper just arses about with the ball at their feet. Spurs don't get that least of life um, without Sam Johnson just arsing about with the ball. Um, and... Aye, you can see the last 10 minutes, Palace looked as if they were, you know, getting themselves back in there, but it's easy, it's easy to go for it and, you know, leave everything on the line when you're turning it and doing and the game's done. 
Yeah, definitely. And Jamie, I'll just get your thoughts on on, on Hodgson as well, and, and then comments. I, I think uh, Colin makes a good point. The older you get, you do just start yeah. not giving up. And he, he's uh, about being being disrespectful to a great manager, but he's sure he's got his last season. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, he was obviously the manager at Liverpool at one point, and that didn't really finish pretty for him. But I was, I was quite shocked by what he actually said. And for those that don't know, he, he basically was asked about what was the biggest disappointment of the match, and he said maybe the young substitutions, who we like to think we can believe in and would help us to a different level, but we didn't show that. They didn't do anything for us at all. Really, we became much weaker when I made the subs. Now, to put it into perspective. He gave three young lads who have 47 minutes of Premier League experience between the three of them and dug them out when they were already 2 0 down at home to Spurs. That doesn't scream Roy, Roy Hudson type of commentary, like, you know, type, type of analysis. I mean, he's always been open and fair, but he's not one for digging his own players out. And that really, really surprised me because that probably signifies there's something else on it going on there. That, as you said, Mason, maybe he has come into a bit of an end and there's that cycle going, but it'd just be a shame if he alienated the rest of the Palace squad because for all intents and purposes, one of the young lads um, I've seen a couple of times at the Unders, um, is it, I think he's got a double-barreled surname, is it Raki Seni or something? He seems pretty decent. He looks as though he's going to have a bright future. I know they were really keen to get him to sign a new contract, but yeah, massively surprised at the way Hodgson handled that. And I wouldn't have been surprised if we probably went into the change room after and went, that didn't land well, and, you know, spoke to them all after a bit. Um, one thing I would, would call it on the game, just to kind of go back, I think I've seen it now the last three games for Spurs. Before the first goal goes in, there's a big save by the Tottenham goalkeeper in the first early stages of each game. And I think there was a double in the Palace game. Palace had the earlier chances. Don't know much about this lad Vasario um, that they've brought in, but he's he's starting he's looking the real deal, you know, with some of the saves he's making, some absolute pearlers, keeps them in the game, stops them from going behind, and then obviously the attacking players turn up. Um, that's that's probably worth a shout because actually we always talk about how well Madison's doing, how well uh, Basuma's coming through, but nobody's actually talking about the goalkeeper. Um, he, he's actually having a stormer from what I've seen so far. Yeah, another player, uh, Mickey Van der Ven as well. I think he's been a brilliant Rapid, isn't he? Absolutely rapid, that lad is. Yeah. So, yeah, was, I think it was a, the ball for it in the first half, and, and I thought, I think it was uh, Edward that was running on yeah. stuff with and literally he had three or four yards on him. And he, it was easy. The, the, there's a really good there's a really good video of him tracking back in a Wolfsburg top from last season where he runs from there the opposing opposition's corner uh, sorry penalty box from a corner um and intercepts um you know just you know on from the goal line it's absolutely ridiculous but that was the reasons why they brought him because they wanted a big fast forward, big fast center back um and he looks the real deal that lad See, just speaking on pace and running with power, can we just take a wee moment to um, give a shout out to Will Hughes, who done his best Roy Hodgson um, <laughs> impression in terms of running through in the first half. Honestly, I had to Google his age after this. Like He's three <laughs> years younger than me, and he would make me look like fucking Mo Salah over 100 yards. I have no... It was painful to watch, actually. Well, you had to rewind it back, thinking he pulled a hammy. Um, and I don't know if it's just shows the Spurs defence are pacey, but it's, oh, it, it looked embarrassing, man. Yeah, he, I'm still surprised he's a Premier League footballer, Colin, to be honest. And funny you brought that up. I remember watching that and thinking, how? How? But, uh, but yeah, there you go. Um, Colin, I'll, I'll come back to you. Then. Um, the, the next game we want to talk about is, is Chelsea with a, a really disappointing result to, to Brentford. I know you're shaking your head there and I'll let you tell the, the listeners why in a second, but uh, I, I thought this was a banker for Chelsea. I mean, they had a, a really disappointing result in the, in the end against Arsenal last week, but for 70 minutes, I thought they were really, really good. Um, but you quickly reminded that, that this Chelsea team is so unpredictable and it's actually Chelsea's eighth Premier League defeat at home in 2023. So, um, Shocking result in the end. Aye, that's grim reading. Uh, eight, eight home defeats starting with Chelsea in 2023. That's, um, 
I really don't know what to say. Like, obviously, I'm shaking my head because I had them in the last man standing <laughs> this week, so I was absolutely fuming. <laughs> but if you look at it, they, they get two two decent victories, a decent result um, against Arsenal, albeit you can maybe say they threw it away. But for much of the game, they were the better team, I thought, um, against Arsenal. Um, and then... <sighs> I do kind of feel for Pochettino. You've seen how frustrated he was. Chelsea, you said it, Mason. They were, they were the the better team for most of this game. I thought that boy Palmer. I really liked the look at him, and you know we had him down to speak about last week. But I think he's he was just involved in in everything in the first half in particular. Um, that kind of free role as the kind of number ten going in and supporting the nine. Um, I really like him time and time again. Like he was getting the ball over the top. He was getting out wide. But Chelsea just couldn't take their chances. Um, you know, there's, I, I don't know how much it is poor finishing or the Brentford keeper had a decent save. But then, you know, Brentford, fair play to them, they stuck at it. Um, you know, I, I think in the, I think the second half, the you seen them towards the end of the game, they started to press up a wee bit higher and they were they were aiming for the counter and they got a lot of joy doing uh, Chelsea's Chelsea's left. I, I can never pronounce his names at Cucurea for you that all the time. Really. Like, aye, the last 20, 30 minutes and you know, a shade of fortune for Brentford, but you're, I'm coming away thinking how how's that a two 0 game? How is it obviously the they go at the end when Chelsea are, are chasing it and the boy the boy, the halfway was really shite. <laughs> First, I thought he was really shooting for the halfway line and um, hit the corner flag, but it wasn't a 2 0 event for game, I don't think. No, it, it weren't. But, but Jamie, Brentford have become the first ever side to win their first three Premier League uh, away games against Chelsea. Um, I think Thomas Frank has never lost at Stamford Bridge in four years. <laughs> That's yeah. absolutely mental. <laughs> um, and, you know, kind of like what Colin said, Chelsea controlled majority of that game. I think they had something like 17 attempts on goal and then only two of them were on target, though. And that's them playing with their, their striker, the one they brought in in the summer, Jackson, who's turning out to be a bit of a myth, in my opinion. Um, as, as Colin said, the, 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 the only positive you could probably call it is actually how well the young lad Palmer's sitting in. He looks to be demanding of the ball, controlling of it. He wants part of every free kick, every corner. He's just getting involved. I don't know what Jackson's doing. I really don't. Um, I think Sterling's looking a loss. Um, and then you've got an 80 million Mudrick, obviously, on the side as well. It, from an attacking sense, it just really struggles to see how Chelsea can improve apart from when the lad and Kunku comes back. Um, but I'd be more concerned defensively, if I'm honest. Um, Thiago Silva didn't look at his, pri- at his prime. And that's all, you know, it's hard to say when considering he's 37 years old. But they've got the, the other young lads, uh, Levi Colwell, who looks a massive talent. You've got the other boy, De Sassi, on the other wing. They're just, they're just getting played through. And then you look at the midfield, they've got... Gallagher, 150 million. Casado, 105 million. Fernandez. It just, I don't know. My my big concern is is if you look at the second goal. Now, will be it. It's the 90th minute or something. The keepers come up for the corner. See, by the time Neil Mopey has got to the halfway line with the ball, he's touched it four times, running, sprinting. There's only one Chelsea player sprinting back with him. And that's the goalkeeper. By the time they reach the goal, no other Chelsea player is within 30 yards of them. That's the bit. Those are the kind of desires I would be questioning. You know, to break next speed, get back, try and do what you can. Yes, you keep us up for a corner, but he shouldn't be the only one trying to run that back and chase them and, you know, um, intercept them. I think there was four four Brentford players in the and in, in, by the time <clears throat> up at the 18 yard line sorry by the time they actually put the ball on the back of the net compared to Chelsea's only player that just shows that there's something majorly not right in my opinion at the Chelsea see just go on, on go that on. Jamie sorry Mason like I, I'm re- I find it really confusing or I, I don't know if it's just maybe part of the part of the transition where you can't do everything at once because I, 
a few weeks ago we were on this podcast saying Chelsea need a solid a striker. They don't look yeah. they don't look too shaky at the back, they look stable, they look because they went about eight games without conceding like they weren't leaking goals. It was either clean sheets or only one goal they conceded. But I don't know, like at the weekend there, it's probably some of the best attacking play you've seen, just terrible finishing. Like is it one or the other? Is that just where they are now in terms of the transition? Well, I think, see, that was probably right three weeks ago. But if you look for the last three games, they've conceded five in the last three games. And two of them are at home. That's not what you would expect from a Chelsea team, you know, with the with the, the defenders that are disposable. And they've got this new keeper, obviously Sanchez, that's a... Um, yes, they're trying to do too much at once. But it just, I don't know. They're just And, and I suppose that the, the one thing that comes to mind as well is does Pochettino have a buy for the season? Does he have a free pass? Because nobody's talking about his skills and, and we'll come to Manchester United later on. Man United, you know, the, 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 the shit the Ten Hag's taking compared to Pochettino. Pochettino's three points worse off than Ten Hag at this moment in time. Um, is, it, is it just widely accepted that Pochettino is going to have this season to win bed and finish wherever they finish and it's all on next season? Because that sounds mental that they've spent a billion pound. They're going to go out and potentially buy a striker in January. Probably spend about another hundred million. And let's be honest, that sounds mad to just have a bit of a free reign and say, "Well, let's just hope we get top ten or something." I don't think you should get a free free run. To be honest, um, this and <clears throat> again, it's Chelsea fans are fairly fairly quiet at the minute. But if it, things continue and the results, they'll they'll turn like every support does. But the signing of Sanchez for me is it was was a big big red red flag in, in the Sideward summer. Step one up, sideways step one up. All, all the money that has been spent to go and then buy a Sanchez and couldn't get a game for Brighton, and they had still been called in the Adam play for nearly two years to make him number one instead. Why is Chelsea going that signing? That was, and I just think that the recruitment. I just think the club's a mess to be honest. And, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe Colin, I don't know, you've, you, you might think he, he deserves the, the season. Well, I, I don't want to say deserves, right? There has to be signs of progress. Um, mm-hmm. If I'm being honest, you're probably seeing a bit more progress with Pochettino than what you did under um, the last couple of managers. Um, the performances are almost there, and I think if you focus on performances long term over results, you're going to be in a better place. Um, you can scrimp one now here and there, it'll eventually catch up on you. You do need to see improvements, but Chelsea are that much a basket case club. They need a bit of stability, whoever that is, whether that's Pochettino. So it doesn't give him a buy, but he doesn't have to go and get the top four to be the Chelsea manager next season, as long as there's enough improvement there to build on. Because if they keep on sacking managers at the rate that they do, they're never going to build anywhere. Um, so would you define improvement as not finishing 13th? <laughs> well, um... <laughs> you know how mad that sounds. I don't know, that's the reason why I said that. Do you know how mad that sounds? Like I, get, I, I completely understand what you're saying, but see when you try and label it out and go right. Okay, what does improvement look like? Is it come back and win games? Is it get stability out of a start at eleven? Is it have strikers available? But at the end of it, they finished thirteen last season. Is it is it just to finish twelve and above? Or well, you know, what for me, like, outside looking in, I'd be looking for Chelsea. And it's it's different because I'm not a Chelsea fan, but I think realistically mm-hmm. they want to be challenging for Europe. So if that's a Europa League spot or a Euro- yeah. uh, Conference League, you can't just get 12th, right? It's, um, you can't <laughs> just be a wee bit pissier than the last pish guy, right? I'm, I'm, I'm being pretentious because Johnny's not here, that's uh, all. <laughs> I know, and there's a reason he's not here after that result. Um, but I think challenging for Europe and you know what, seeing signs of what they're trying to do, um, to yeah. build on for the following year, I, I would say that gets them the job next year. Yeah, definitely. And I've just got to mention it quickly. What is Neil Morpé doing at the end of the <laughs> uh, He doesn't put that in the net. I've, I've, I've had to watch it three or four times because I've, I've thought, did he fall under his feet? Did he? Did I think he the keeper touches, I think the touches it. Did I think the keeper actually tackles him and puts it into into um in Buero's path. That is just a player that's not scoring a goal all season, by the way. It's just yeah. it's shocking. But um, but yeah, I had to get that in. Um, Denver's yeah. was a cracker. See the boy Pinnock. 
I think his last I think his last goal he scored was against Man City last season. Um coming in the back post exactly the same. And you know, that pace and power from that that, you know, five, six yards out, they'll keep a stop in that. Um but their overall defending just seemed very sporadic. And then you add that to the fact that they can't shoot and score. They desperately need people like Nkunku back. And apparently he's back training, but he's nowhere near. He's only just started touching grass, I feel like. So he's probably still going to be the new year before he comes back. But I'm looking forward to seeing him. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's a top player. It'll definitely make a difference one fit. But Jamie, I'll stay with you, come back to you. Uh, Arsenal uh, absolutely smashed Sheffield United again. I think everyone would have had this as a banker, and it, it definitely was. Um, the question I'm going to come to you with, though, obviously, and Ketty up with a hat trick. Um, a little bit of a debate um, going around after the game that should he be Arsenal's number nine instead of instead of Jesus? Um, I would say no. And I'm going to base it off last season. So Eddie and Ketia only touched the team last season because Jesus got injured. Pretty much the same as what he did this time. He was great for about four or five games and then kind of played a side role, became more in the involvement of the goals as opposed to scoring them. I wouldn't be surprised if he does the exact same again now. He was obviously flung in at the weekend. I don't think he would have started if, if Jesus would have been fit. He took his chances. That third goal was an absolute rocket. That was Henri like in the way he turned and wrapped his foot around and put it in the top bin. Very impressed with that. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't score for two games now. Because not that he's not worthy of it, but Arsenal needs somebody more deadly, in my opinion, up front. Um, more deadly than Jesus and Nketiah. I think Nketiah is a good backup. I think it's the, the challenges of Nketiah sees himself as that backup. Um, because the moment he gets a run of games, he probably does start to not have a return, shall I say. But when he's flung in for the odd game or two, he does pretty well. Yeah, Colin, um, same same question to you on that. Um, and, and I still, I, I really like Inketia. And I think Jesus is, is another good player, but I make Jamie right. I think they are missing still. Uh, I still think they need a, a proper number nine. And it just surprised me again when you look at the money they spent for Havertz. That, that you- wasn't Sorry, Colin, do you know what it is? In my opinion, the Arsenal fans are so keen on Anketia being the one because he's he's a young lad, he's came through. He he would be, they want him to be their Harry Kane, you know, the one that kind of stays with the club, doesn't cost him any money and scores him a shitload of goals. I just don't see him like that at all. And I think they're just, they're onto plums if they think he's going to be that guy. It's a hard one um, because it's it's almost two separate questions here. Is he a better option than Jesus, or is he the is he the long term answer? Um, right now, in in the incarnation of both these players, in Ketia and Jesus, I don't think either of them are the long term option. Um, I think that like, we do need somebody a bit more prolific. Um, you know, Harry Kane is it's very hard to go and get some some of them. The problem you do have though, and I've said it time and time again on here, like when you get somebody like Harry Kane, it's very hard to get depth because nobody wants to come sit behind a Harry Kane because you know they're not going to get a game. <laughs> you then look to get the two two players to battle out for each other, but as Jamie says, and yeah, he never does it. He never does it consistently. He's he's what I've just checked there uh, just under a one in four striker, um, which is all right for a second fiddle striker if your main guy is banging him in. Um, I I've, I didn't realise he was he was twenty four, and I know twenty four still young. He's still at his peak. But when we talk about this young boy, this you know this starlet coming through, I, I always thought he was maybe twenty twenty one. You think that he is really going to have a massive jump? He will be approaching his peak pretty soon. Um, I think the ability is there. I don't know what it is. Maybe it is just the nerves or uh, mentality, or maybe it's just some players can't do it consistently. I don't think. I think I think I can see Arsenal chopping and changing between him and Jesus this year, but neither are the long term answer. Just to see, he, 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 to me, just misses that ruthlessness. He had a hat trick and he had an opportunity of taking a penalty, and he passed it. Mo Salah doesn't pass that to anybody. Kane doesn't pass that to anybody. And, and I mean that selfishly. Like that's your stats. That's your. I, I know Arsenal go for this. We all, we all are all together. We're a family, but. If you're that striker, if you want to go, no, this is my role, I'm sorry, you don't give that to Nibdi. You take that and you bang it in and become, I think he would have become only the third player to score for Arsenal four games and a good, and a, sorry, four goals in the game behind Henri and Oshavin. 
when he did Marshall. that article. Mm-hmm. That was, you know what I mean? Again, put your name in fucking lights. He would yes. be the pub quiz question. He didn't. He passed it to another sub. The guy who earned the penalty, Fabio Vieira, wouldn't it? But what I would say, sorry, just on in here, yeah, Mason. Um, I am a big fan of if you don't have a out and out number nine, then the best way around that is what Man City done a couple of years ago. And make sure your goals come for all areas in the pitch. <coughs> so there's a wee bit of work to do that for Arsenal, but you, you can see where they're starting to build. You've got the likes of Saka, um, Martinelli, um, Trossard, the, the midfield's looking a wee bit more dangerous, I think. And Kitia brings the team in more than Jesus does. Um, so if that's what I try to build long term, it, it may be. You don't need in Kitia to be scrolling every game if the person next to him is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of talk of them bringing in Tony as well, isn't there? In, in the January yeah. window. You know, 63 million apparently the buyout close has been set. I think that would be a massive difference for them because Tony's a big, tall player. You know, wants the ball in up the top. And Arsenal don't play like that. They play down the wings, don't they? They come in from the flanks on the wrong foot, and you know that would be interesting to see because I think he, he, I think he's deadly enough. Ivan, you know, Ivan Tony, I think he would improve that massively. I think that Chelsea, Spurs, and Arsenal, I reckon he'll have the pick. And I think, I think all three of them will, will try and get time, especially in being being English. I'll, I'll be surprised. I would have thrown Man United in there, but I don't think anyone wants to go there in a minute. But uh, I don't. I don't think Chelsea go British. I think Chelsea go abroad for a, for a striker. I think they'll look at Osman or something. You know, they'll want the big ticket name that goes with it. Yeah, yeah, that that, that would that would definitely sum up sum up Chelsea. But look, Sheffield United have lost their last ten away games in London and lost nine out of ten. Um, Jamie, how long is it before Heckingbottom's in? Well, oh, totally had myself on mute then, like a plum. Um, it's, it's, do you know what? It, it kind of feels very much, but in a worse situation. Do you remember Steve Gibson at Nottingham Forest last season? He kept getting the dreaded vote of confidence, and everybody's like, oh, he's one, one loss away from getting punted. And all of a sudden, he comes out and signs a new contract. I think it's got shades of that, but can they afford to punt him? I don't think he'll be on much money, but with the amount of losses they're talking about in terms of this guy's wanting to sell the club very, very quickly, can he afford not only to sack his manager and his staff, but then to bring another one in? I think they might be stuck with him for a period of time, and I think they've got this gentleman's agreement that you know maybe they will part ways at the some some stage. Um, I seen a stat the other day that they are on course. Um, so Derby have obviously got the infamous title of having the lowest points um, by the end of the season. Even that Derby team had more points than, than the Sheffield United team at this point at this stage of the season. So everything points to rapid relegation, shall I say, um, which didn't doesn't surprise us. But I think it becomes untenable for a manager to a point. I'm very surprised he's still there, but then again, I'm not because of the dire situation that they're in financially. Yeah, Colin, just quickly, same same question to you um, with, with Heckenbottom. Um, I'm going to cut him a little bit of slack here. I think that Sheffield United squad, I was looking at it <coughs> excuse me, the other night, and anyone that was in that job, I think it's got a really difficult to keep them up. I just don't see the players there. But is this a time to do it early and get some, some maybe some Premier League experience in there? Maybe Allardyce or someone similar? It's a hard one, isn't it? Because um, it's... The stats speak for themselves. Um, one point after ten games. That's now officially the worst. Um, the worst Premier League start after ten games. The second worst um, is Sheffield United two years ago. Um, they beat themselves in goal difference. Um, <laughs> don't say I don't do my homework, folks. But no, the the only thing I can maybe think that gives them a bit of saving grace is the rest. Are so poor as well. The bar is so low. I mean, like two realistically, four points out of their four points out of their next two games should take them to eighteen up two points. You know what I mean? Because you don't see. I don't really fancy Burnley and Luton to do too much, and Bournemouth have just won the famous six pointer. Um, I don't see the teams around them doing too much as well. So maybe that's. Maybe that's in the chairman's thinking there as well. If he doesn't want to part with money, um, 
you know, it's it's a bit less of a gamble because if it, you don't need to be great, you just need to be less shit than the other three. Yeah, that, and it's going to be interesting. Um, this this relegation race, but I think Sheffield United have gone already. Um, Colin, stay with you then. Um, the Saturday night game, Wolves to Newcastle to um, a lot of controversy over over this one, and I think it's the best sort of place to start. Um, was it a penalty on the stroke of half time for Callum Wilson to put Newcastle um, back in the lead? Aye, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> it's a penalty. Like, so sorry for the listeners' uh, benefit. Jamie got whiplash here. His head turned round that quickly. Absolutely mental decision. <laughs> Contacts made. I, I think it's a penalty. Like I, I don't see what all the fuss is about. Um, the, the world's managers are just fucking sour grapes. Um, no, I, I genuinely do. I'm not just that I like <laughs> click bit here. I think it's a penalty. Like, what, what's your rationale for no? I think there's no contact at all. Absolutely no contact really? at all. The foot's planted, and the guy takes a swan dive. He tips his foot. Uh, there's no contact at all for me. I think I think it's amplified by the fact that the weather conditions of you know wet and slidey and you know torrential rainpour. But even on a VAR review, I was massively surprised that they didn't overturn that. Yeah, me too. I've got to say, I was quite shocked with that. Um, well, it comes out in the middle. Colin loves a penalty. He loves a penalty, doesn't he? <laughs> always, yeah. Colin loves a free hit from 12 yards. <laughs> I always look at it to sort of, always think if it's us, if, if, if that's against us, you know what I mean? I try and look at it that way. And if that's given against us, I am absolutely doing my nut. Um, I, I think I think he called it. But is it is it a clear and obvious error? That's that's the debate. Isn't it? That's that's this is what it is. You know, as I said, Colin said, yes, yeah, the pen we've said it's not. So that's uh, it's going to be one of them. But uh, but Jamie, I mean, I thought Newcastle in the end looked quite leggy, and and I thought Wolves in the second half definitely deserved something out of the game. And it's it would be wrong not to mention um, Chang, who scored now six Premier League goals, and I thought the second one was a brilliant finish. Pe- People are not giving Wolf credit. I mean, I certainly didn't at the beginning of the season. I thought they'd be relegation fodder, but they've the last three or four games they've been brilliant. You know, they've beaten City. They had a great spirited performance against Liverpool before it all went Pete Tong. They should have won that game. I think they were, you know, they were ahead. Um, they beat City. They've uh, been scoring quite. Well, do you remember we've been saying the problem with, with Wolves is all about where their goals are coming from, and everybody naturally thinks it's going to be Pedro Neto because he's the most influential. But the boy Chan has been brilliant. Um, he's he's been. Positive. Up in the back, but the back he's been getting the, t- the drop downs. Um, I think they fully deserved that draw at the weekend. Um, I actually had it down as a draw in my prediction, just purely for the fact that City, sorry, uh, Newcastle were coming off a Champions League game, which they looked, as you said, very, very leggy in that. So I wasn't surprised when it came to the evening game, and you just think, oh, that might, that don't, that might be a fixture that they don't want. They've obviously got the Tenali issue to deal with now, and they're picking up injuries. Uh, Jacob Murphy looks as always dislocated his shoulder. He we had a barnstorm two weeks ago, so he looks to be out. Isak's out. The, the, the treading real thin now. I think that it was announced today that Botman's going to be missing for a few more weeks. So again, that's that means they're going to go back to a 900 year old like Jamal Lascelles um, to, to kind of hold the, the stall for them. Um, so uh, I think we'll start to know a bit more about Newcastle in the next few weeks. But mega pleased for Wolves because I think they've been putting in the performances but haven't been getting the results or the or the credit for it. So and Gary O'Neill again, Graham's favourite one we always talk about. I think he's doing a job. Um he did his he did his spat on Monday Night Football a few weeks back and gained a lot of credit from a lot of pundits. And it just looks as though it's happening on the pitch for him right now. So kudos to him. Yeah, and just quickly, Colin, uh, just from a Newcastle side of things, obviously Callum Wilson gets the double, but as Jamie said, their injuries are starting to hit them. They've got the Tenali issue. Um, is this going to you know, disappoint a result for them midweek in the Champions League at home? Is this where Newcastle sees it? I still think they're unbeaten in the last six or seven Premier League games, but you know, 2 1 up with 20 25 minutes to go, they'll be disappointed. They didn't see that out. 
if you remember last year, like Newcastle, they, they had a decent season, but they maybe around February, March time, they were dropping a lot of points. Um, maybe not losing games, but you know a lot of draws um, where they probably should be getting it over the line. And I think we all called it when Newcastle and Brighton this year. How's Europe going to impact them for the first time in a long time? How they got to deal with that? So that's the last two Champions League games where they've came off and draw. They, they drew with West Ham and now they've drew with Wales, both to each incidentally, but. We know we we all called it there. They they didn't add the depth that we thought they did. Um, now Tenali is he's he's not going to be playing much football at all for Newcastle. That's an option to in a way getting injuries. I think they'll struggle over. There's a lot of football played in November and December traditionally for another another what three Champions League games maybe. But a couple of League Cup games as well. I think they will struggle um, until they get to January. I can see them um, if financial fair play allows. They'll maybe spend a bit of money in January, get some reinforcements in. But maybe no, maybe no losses, Mason. But I, I can see them slipping up with the odd draw here and there. Yeah, definitely. Me too. But, um, Colin, I will stay with you then. Um, Bournemouth. Big win for Bournemouth. Uh, they beat Burnley 2-1. I think the last time I was on, I was going through Burnley and, and company, and I'll just copy and paste that. But that was a, uh, a end, Bournemouth ended a run of 13 successive league games without a defeat. Um, and that, for me, I think their two best players scored the goals in Semenyo and uh, Billing. I'm a big fan of Semenyo, and I'm, I've, I've actually got him in fantasy team, and I think that was his first start in four or something. But I don't know why. Um, but what was your thoughts on, on that one on, on Saturday? Is it too early to call that a six pointer? Um, I don't think it is. Uh, it, I do kind of feel for Burnley. Um, I, I thought they were good, I thought they were all right. Um, particularly in the first half, um, I, I thought they played well. And it's for me, you're right, the two Burnley. The two best players in the park for Bournemouth scored the goals, but both goals came from Burnley's stupidity. I think losing the ball in cheap areas, and I think we were talking about Sheffield making the step up for, uh, from the Championship. Burnley just don't seem to have that ruthlessness, that that concentration it takes. You, you can't switch off for a minute, even against teams like Bournemouth. It's such a big jump for the Championship to the Premier League. It's a shame. I thought they had one of their better games and. You know, I'm not going to say Bournemouth didn't deserve it, but I do think I don't know if Bournemouth get these goals if if Burnley don't switch off at, at, at those moments. Jamie, what was your thoughts on this one? I, I agree with Colin. I think that <clears throat> Burnley have caused their own problems, and I actually listened to a um, podcast with Craig Bellamy last week. I don't know if you boys have listened to it as well. And you he, dirty he, bastard! I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I'm not. I'm not great player. I never liked him as a as a sort of the way he come across. I thought it was always he's a he's a El Jeff of yeah, Wales, yeah. isn't he? But he was, he was a good little player. Um, um, I'll, I'll give him that. But um, it was his comment about saying that they're not going to change. That Burnley are not going to change the way they play. They're, they're going to continue to do that. And when I watch things like Saturday, it frustrates the life out of me because I just think, I think you need to change. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about was the overlap he did with Gary Neville. Yeah, I watched that one as well, and I was yeah he, he, caught, he commented because they talked about obviously a lot of people are trying to dictate to Victor Vincent Company of how she should be playing because he doesn't adapt. He's got his weight, he's got his method, and his method is the and and Burley backed Bellamy backed him up and went no, he's right. We are not doing anything wrong. We're just not doing enough without the ball, um, and and that kind of perceived Colin's statement, which was they didn't do anything good with the ball because they got the ball taken off him and, and it was turned into goals. Um, I think, you know, I'm with you, Mason. Semenu, I think we said it a couple of weeks ago, Semenu had a good start to the season. He scored against Liverpool, but for some reason he was sitting on the bench and if they were looking for goals, why was he not playing? So, uh, obviously, the Spanish coach listened to us, um, chucked him in, and uh, he was one of the stars of the show. Um, but I don't think we can not talk about this game and not talk about the VAR issue that happened in the game, which is the VAR room pretty much had an argument um, with themselves about the the green line, the red line, 
and it's and it's uh, David Coots who was arguing with. So basically, what they've done is in VAR, they've now added a layer of security, and that says before any decision is made, it has to go to an independent person standing behind them to confirm the decision that they're making is the decision that they're talking about. And you could see the person he was confirming with went, "That's not right." That's a green line, and I can quite clearly see his head in front of that bloody green line. And David Coots was obviously trying to challenge his opinion or whatever, and he had to go back and redraw it. David Coots is a local VAR chief for this weekend, so I'm absolutely shitting it. Um, but again, over it, see if Bournemouth would have lost that game based on that VAR incident, we would have this whole scenario again, all this whole issue. But that aside. There was the Burnley were really, really desperate. I think they had a goal chopped off at the end, didn't they? Uh, was there there's a shove on the goalkeeper or was that it was holding the goalkeeper, I think. I think that was a right call. It didn't look great when it, when the when the incident happened. And I know Vincent Company was very, very <clears throat> what was I gonna say? He he said something like he doesn't understand the decision. He doesn't understand how the referees have been coming to these decisions. But I'm gonna spit my dummy out now. Vinny Company, after the Luis Diaz incident against Spurs, says we should help the referees, we should support them. So it, it's okay when it doesn't when it doesn't involve his team, but when it involves his team, he wants to pick out the refs. So I think you can come at it from both angles, but Bum Bum Bournemouth needed that win, and so did Burnley. One of them had to win. We wouldn't be talking about it the way we were off it finished one each. Um, so it was a massive six pointer for Bournemouth. Um, sadly, Vinnie Company looks to be in the shit pile for a couple of more weeks, um, and that is possibly going to be coming down to the fact that, as you said, Mason, his desire is not to change the way he plays, which sounds a bit naive to be fair. And you know, we all applauded, we all called out how well we thought of Vinnie Company at the beginning of the season, what he'd done. But every manager knows he's got to adapt. Every manager knows he's got to take on it. Even Klopp's had to adapt to Liverpool. Even Pep Guardiola to some extent. I don't know if that might be a bit naive from him. I just think, <clears throat> just on that, I think, look, if you've got a way you want to play and that's what you believe in, then absolutely you do what, you know, you 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 take that on and you, you say to your players, this is what I want you to do. I believe in this. This is how we're going to play. But see, when you're a team like Burnley, where success is just staying in the Premier League, you want to play that way, you're going to have to adapt because you've got to have a B plan, haven't you? Plan B, haven't you? 100%. And that's, that's the problem with a lot of managers now. It's my way or no way, but mm -hmm. their way, they're getting sacked early doors. And then, as I said, if he, if, he, if he gets the sack here, he wants to be Man City manager one day or manager mm -hmm. one of the bigger clubs. He's going to have to start again. So I just think I can't understand it, to be honest. It's my own one, but. But wait, we'll move on. Uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll stay with you um, just, just quickly with this one because it weren't it weren't too much happening. And now we're on to the Sunday games. Um, Brighton won, Fulham won. Um, the coupon buster. Yes. The coupon buster. I think everybody had that one done for a home win, didn't they? Um, um, but Brighton have never beat Fulham in a Premier League fixture, so maybe that was something to look at before. That's mad, isn't it? A, 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 a ball was kicked but the question I want to ask you with this one uh, obviously Ferguson on the score sheet again um, he, he looks like a really good young player um, but should Polina have been sent off because Brighton were quite agreed with that I thought Polina was excellent I thought he was outstanding I thought he had one of his best games um, he's he's a proper he's a I'm not going to say dirty midfielder. He's the one that you'd want in your team, but you'd hate to play against. And that rainy weather that they were in, he was sliding from the halfway line. They were still sliding by the time he got to the 18-yard line. But he was getting the ball. He was winning it. He was just forceful. He was direct. I thought the lad was brilliant. He scored that. Absolutely, he scored that that goal as well, um, which was a was a was a was a cracker in its own right. Um, I think this was more Brighton shit in the bed because this was another not win after a European fixture. This was, um, I think he attempted to rotate the team a little bit and it wasn't really their normal first start in 11. Um, João Pedro, for example, um, didn't get on. Um, you know, the, the, the way they started with people behind um, Jao, uh, the, the boy Evan Ferguson, it just, I don't know, I think there was an element of they just expected to win it. Um, and, I, and I think I think you've got to look at the fact that they don't have Solly March at the moment, who uh, allowed them to tick quite a lot. You know, Solly March is very much an unsung hero in, in the Premier League in the last couple of seasons for them. Um, he's not had the plaudits all the other players have. Um, 
Matoma's had a couple of quiet games, but that's understandable if he's playing Europe week in, week out, and then playing the Premier League. He's ultimately going to have a dry spell. The difference was last year was that other people were pitching him with the goals. That, that that's the big difference from this year. Um, Estupian's not not training yet. I think he's just I think he's due back in the next two weeks. He'll be a big help for them. But yeah, big kudos to um, Fulham because I thought they played brilliant. They 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 went up there probably not expecting much and came away with uh, a well well in draw in my opinion. Yeah, it was a. And you're right, Polina was a. He, I don't really rate him. I think he's a, he's a, he's a right good player. But Colin, are we seeing now the, the sort of downside to being in Europe for a club like Brighton? Because uh, as we said, this was a, a bank. I think all three of us would have picked them to, to win and a game they probably would have won last season. But Thursday night football, um, as West Ham have learned, uh, getting used to it takes a, takes a while. I mean, I was going to say top in pace, what we said about Newcastle, but I think at least Newcastle are maybe grinding out um, like results and getting points. But Brighton have been, they've been poor. It's not been sluggish and they have been poor after Europe and um, and even midweek in general. So they, they did beat one nil off Chelsea in the cup. It was that the weekend they got studied like 4 5 1, 6 1 off uh, Aston Villa. And then, you know, it's it's not just the points are the the points are losing, it's the manner of them. And I, I think Jamie's right there where there's no there's no really that goal for it. Like back to what we were talking about with what Arsenal might do to and get um try and set up your team to get goals for you all around the pitch. But, you know, that does take a, a level of athleticism and you know and, and being sharp at all times. If not, you need to you need to have the depth to back up, and I don't think they do have that. Um, They're conceding uh, quite a lot of goals this season compared to they last are, season. Which, yeah, and it's the same defense apart from the goalkeeper. That's it's instead of Sanchez, it's now Steele, isn't it? Uh, so you, there's not much difference. The, they didn't get the credit for their defense last year, Jamie, because we spoke about their free flowing like forward thinking Attacking, against football, yeah. but they were solid at the back. They only knew it. they. You know, they just looked a bit sluggish. Um, so I think they'll have a, a rougher time than Newcastle over the next couple of months, if I'm being honest. Yeah, got, got, got to agree with that, uh, Colin. Uh, Colin, I'll say you, though, um, <clears throat> big win for Everton this one. They beat West Ham 1 0 at the London Stadium. Jamie's fuming. I can't wait to get his uh, thoughts on this one. But, but Colin, uh, West Ham fans were calling for Kudos to get a start, but it didn't end well. And, and to be honest, the first 20 25 minutes, I thought that it was going to be a field day for West Ham and it didn't end up like that. I thought Everton had the better chances. And to be honest, I thought they, they deserved the win in the end. Um, Calvert Lewin got the winner and he becomes Everton's fourth player to score 50 Premier League goals. Just think how many he would have scored if he wasn't injured 90% of the time. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, West Ham did start behind. West Ham, like they, they dominated most of the ball throughout the game. But Everton, I think we spoke about this early on in the season, how they, they, they are sitting and and you know try to hit in the counter. Um, they, it's not always it's not always worked too well when Calvert Lewin's been up top. Um, and they've not always had the pace to do it. But I think they've won decent fullbacks, um, decent pace at fullback. Also, I'm a big fan of and Nathan Patterson as well. Um, but the Ukrainian boy on the other side as well, I think they, they do help their game going forward. And when they soak up pressure, I think they move the ball up the park quite well. Um, I, I thought Everton did, did deserve it. I, um, I know Jamie's got to come in and you know, talk about, um, you know, talk about how Sean Dyke should get the sack and everybody supports Everton's a dick, whether you or other pool fans call them. Um, you but, paint real bad pictures of me, you really do. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I wonder why. It, it, I'm, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Everton deserved that win. Everton have won four of the last seven games. And I think it's no coincidence that people have started to come back from injuries. I think Jack Harrison was brilliant the last couple of weeks. Didn't have a great game on Sunday, but he was involved in the game to, to you know, from an attacking point. The lad that impresses me, though, is the young lad at the back, centre-back, Brantwaite. He's so young and he's an absolute unit. The lad is an absolute unit. Um and he, start, he, he looks as though he's coming on. Do you remember when do you remember when John Stones came through 
um, when they brought John Stones through and, you know, he was getting that. There's just something about him that reminds me, I'm not going to say he's going to get to that kind of level, but there's just something that, you know, there's a good player on there and he just needs to stick on the right path. Um, I don't think Tarkowski does him any favours, but the lad Brandtweet, like, he, he just no business. You know, you know, he just runs through people to, to some extent. Um, but, yeah, Dominic calvert has scored a good goal at the weekend. I was more surprised at how that lost to West Ham were, um, especially after they, they, they lost the first game in Europe in something like 17 games, I think it was, on last week. He tried to freshen the team up and try and get them back into a winning shape. I just don't think you can do that when you've got people like Michael Antonio up top. I really don't. I think kudos. Um, I, I, seen, I, think, I, I think I've seen like the first 30 minutes. And the lad Kudos got into an altercation with uh, one of the Everton lads, and oh, it was that's... like a pushing game. Yeah, it was like a real pushing game, um, and it just it, you know it, it threw him off his game. And that's exactly what Everton are going to do to you. They're going to get in your face. They're going to make it hard for you, and they're going to make going to wind you up. Um, well, just on that, Joe, if you make a good point about Moyes there with Antonio, but what I couldn't understand was fifty-eight minutes in, he hooks Antonio. He's yeah. then got Kudos. Ben Rama, Owen up front, none of them are number nines. And that yeah. played right into Everton's hands. And just interesting, I, I see West Ham have got Arsenal tomorrow in the yeah. league. Then they've got Brentford away on Saturday. See if they get a couple more. That we say, you know, if they lose tomorrow, which I think... It, it, could, it could be four losses in the space of a week and a half. Five. It could be five. Yeah. <laughs> that that mental, that. Five, so... And, and I've said it all season with West Ham, they've done really well, started brilliantly. They'll still go through top in, in the Europa League group, I'm sure. But that little, I knew as soon as they hit a bump in a row with Moyes, the fans are start going to turn because... Yeah. I think we all knew that. We all do that, didn't we? Yeah, he was always on to, he was always onto a hide in the moment that didn't go right for him. Um, I think, you know, even even the James Wood Prowse chat's gone quiet now, hadn't it? You know, he, he was he was involved in goals in the first two or three games, and then Bowen took over, and you, you're not hearing much about James Wood Prowse. I still think he's a good buy for them. I still think he does the right jobs, but yeah, it just it's it, they need to come through this next week and a half, I think, in my opinion, but. The Everton game didn't do them any favours at all. Um, and to kind of control, just a bit of randomness for you. Um, remember the lad Skamaka that they had there last season that couldn't hit a bond door? Google his goal for last night from for At- Atalanta. He he runs through on goal and back heels it through the keeper's legs. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you just think, he's a number nine. The way he's playing at Atalanta right now, he's a number nine. He's a player, by the way. He's yeah. A he's a top goal scorer in the Italian league this season. They brought him, wasn't he? I see him over, um, I went over West Ham a little while ago and I watched him, he scored, he did score a lot of goals when he was there, but he scored a belt up against Wall for about 25 yards. It was like Hallard when he was there, and then yeah. two number nines, they just didn't work for whatever reason, but yeah, they've proved. But just on, just to finish up on that, um, Everton have won more Premier League away games against West Ham than any other opponent. Um, oh, that, Mason coming with uh, the facts, love it. And that's <laughs> West Ham. Um, first time they've failed to score in the Premier League at home in 2023. So, a couple of stats for you boys. Um, yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll move on because we've got a few more games and I know that the last one we're going to be talking about quite a while. So, uh, <laughs> Jamie, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you then. Just, just really quickly on this one, Aston Villa, comfortable win against uh, Luton, 3-1. Yep. Villa's 20th win um, this calendar year and only Man City at one more. I think nobody gave Luton a shout at the beginning of the game, and rightly so. They've not been scoring that many goals. I'm, I'm surprised they did get a goal. Um, the, probably the biggest shock of the afternoon was that Watkins didn't get in on the action. Um, however, um, <laughs> there's something that they you can you can tell that they train well. And what I mean is, if you look at the first goal, McGinn from the corner. Everything about it, that, that that setup is absolutely synchronised. There's no lucky deflection. There's no lucky drop. He pings it to the right person. He runs onto it. And he hits it with the foot. People barge people out the way. They know exactly what's coming. You can tell that's a team that trains well at the moment. They're on at such a high. Um, and, and I think you've seen that as well with people like the unsung people, like David Louise, uh, Douglas Louise, sorry. Douglas Louise looks... Looks like I'm sort of bored this season. I think he's got four goals, two of them are penalties, but he's got four goals and about three assists or something this season. And he got an assist, obviously, at the weekend. Um, the lad Diaby looked really good as well. Um, so 
yeah, I think I think I think this was a gimme for Aston Villa compared to the fact how many goals they scored in the last two or three weeks. You would have expected them to score at least two goals this weekend. Um, so no surprises. Um, I think obviously Luton were always going to be on to um, a chance of going there, um, but biggest shot was probably just that Luton actually got a goal. <laughs> Um, it was a strange, it was a weekend for own goals, wasn't it, this weekend? It yeah. know, that was. Colin, yeah, Luton have made their worst ever start to a season across the, the four tiers in English football, but there's no, I think everyone would, would have predicted that anyway. Again, but it's so bizarre, those two teams worse than them. Um, that's, um, you know, and that's where it gives you, I'll, I'll know way by the point, but I'll give all, all three the the bottom three right now, all three of the teams that came up, that the bar isn't high um, right now. Bournemouth are just in front of them. Um, that, you know, we really need to be going to take as many points as they can for the home games and the when they play the teams round about them because they're not going to go to Villa Park and get anything in the month for Sundays. No, not now, not towards the end of the season unless Villa are going for a European final and Luton having them the week before. Um, and they just rotate all 11 players. <laughs> aye, and they're playing the under-16s. That's, you know, there's, there's a clear gap um, of, there's such a gap even, you know, maybe the, the top 12 right now, you don't really see the bottom three being able to take anything off of them at all. So it has to be the home games against the, the bottom six and that's where Luton should be, should be aiming for. Yeah, definitely. Jamie, in a couple more games, we'll, we'll come to you for the Liverpool uh, result. Big, uh, <clears throat> well, comfortable 3-0 win. Um, if you must, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> It was, uh, it was, as I said, it was, it was easy street, really. Um, Liverpool were unbeaten their last 17 Premier League home games. And it, I think it was a year to the day, Sunday, that they lost their last one against Leeds. So they're on a, a back to <clears throat> making Anfield a fortress. And I've just got to say, I think Sir Bosla is, he's class. He's, he's, do, 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 the, the biggest credit I can give him right now is that he's not getting enough credit. And I think, you know, you look at team of the weeks and you look at team of the season so far, nobody's putting him in his team. He is absolutely purring at Liverpool. He really is. From an attacking sense, from a, he, he loves a tackle. He loves a tackle. He defends well from corners. He gets the, He's the one that, see when the ball drops to him, he's up, he's looking, he pings it out. He's, I can't, I can't talk his praise. He's good enough. The lad is an absolute boss. Um, the, the, there was a chat. There was I read something the other day that he he spoke to Klopp before the Everton game, and and he said that he was dead nervous. And Klopp asked him why he was nervous, and apparently this was his first actual derby that he ever got to play in. Um, and you could just tell this lad absolutely he, he oozed that day. He honestly did. He got two assists at the weekend, um, and he's just getting all the plaudits in terms of from Liverpool fans. They're absolutely in love with him. I seen. I was down at Anfield at the beginning of the season. I went to see the, I was at a Bournemouth game and he be, he was by far the best player on the pitch. Um, the, the way he runs with the ball, his pass, it's just top notch. It really is. Um, and obviously all the, all the strikers are getting the plaudits, you know, Salas and your, your Darwin Nunes, um, who's on a rich way of form right now as well. But Sabozla is just outstanding. He really is. Um, I, I can't wait to see him just keep on developing. Um, but from a, from a game point of view, it meant a little bit more, but pretty much because of obviously the tragic news about uh, Luis Diaz's family, um, and and Jota showed the unity, um, you know, by holding up the top when he got the first goal in. Um, it's obviously heartbreaking to to see that, and even Klopp commented after the game and said, "Never had to deal with this as a manager before. How does a human try and deal with this? Never mind a manager." Um, so you know, it's obviously it's a sore one that's still ongoing now. Um, so, you know, all, all our hearts go out to Luis Diaz and his family at the moment. But, you know, back to by, back to business, we, we had to put three points on the board. And I think we did it comfortably. And you go back to last season. And I remember last season, we were away to Nottingham Forest just after we got promoted. And we lost 1-0. And that was the start of our poor run, if you like, of all these early kickoffs on the Saturday that we just weren't getting across the line. You look at where we are now, it's night and day. Absolute night and day. Liverpool v- version number two is on the way for Klopp, and he said so. Um, I, I I just can't wait to see us, you know, click even more. Um, be interesting to see what we do in the summer, as are in the January window. I think we're still maybe one or two players late, but from Salah to Nunes to to Jota to to Sobozlai, they all look like an absolute machine. They really do, and nobody's talking about it. That's 
you know, when everybody's talking about Tottenham, everybody's talking about, we've done it, we've talked about Tottenham, we've talked about Arsenal, everybody's expecting City, nobody's talking about Liverpool, they're just saying, oh, Liverpool will be, be there fighting for it. I think, I think, you know, with the run of games that are coming up, I think there's a very strong chance we, we could be fighting out for the top two, and I know we're I'm blowing my own trumpet a little bit, but it's just how well we're playing at the moment. Colin, what's your thoughts on that? I think. Um, sorry, I, think I just realised that was like 500 words in three minutes, so sorry. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Demi makes a point now about Liverpool quietly going about their business, but I don't mind. See, I don't mind that. See, see if a bit different for us being Rangers fans, because the news is always us or, or them, but obviously with Premier League, there's a lot more teams competing. But but see, I, I like that. If you just quietly go about your business, then all of a sudden you're in a position to go and take, take it. And, and as Jamie said, they've got Salah, Nunes. You know, Jota, uh, Sabozla, you know, all start, and, and, and I think there's others there that, that, that can come in and do Gakpo's it. Gakpo's coming back. Gakpo's another one, you know, um, and, and, and obviously just to echo, um, you know, with Diaz as well, and, uh, you know, what Jamie said. And, and, and yeah, when I read that, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. So hopefully that gets, you know, sorted soon and, and he can get back playing. Yeah, no, definitely is. Put things in perspective, isn't it? It is things bigger than football. Um, it's, it's tragic, but just on Liverpool, I actually think the, the like Arsenal maintaining the form and Spurs grabbing the headlines is certain them. Like, just to echo that again because Liverpool, I agree with you, Jamie. That, that I think Graham Gamble called this out a few weeks ago. Liverpool's run of games, they've had to go to. Um, Stamford Bridge um, early on in the season, albeit we didn't know what Chelsea they would have. They've had to go away to Brighton. They've they've played Arsenal. They've had to go away to St James's Park as well, and they're, they're three points off the top. Um, away as well. Spurs away as well. That was the other one. Um, here's a start for you, and just taking the echo Liverpool's firepower in every game bar two. This season, Liverpool have scored in the first half, and I've been looking at that. Um, comparing that with Arsenal, Man City, Spurs, Liverpool have a better record for scoring in the first half than any other of the top four right now. And that's like, it's not just quietly going about their business. I think they're confidently going about their business, but no one's noticing. We spoke about this at the start of the season, their firepower, and that's that's what Liverpool should be doing. They're, they are getting in. And they're not killing games off early in the first half, but they are getting... Uh, ahead in front, making teams open up against them and then going and killing them. Um, I, I can't wait for it to see uh, is this going to be another you know, another crop masterpiece this season. Um, November and December will, will tell us what everything we need to know. They're away to Man City 25th of November and December they're at home in Man U and Arsenal. We'll know how serious Liverpool are about this uh, about this title challenge um, after these games. I think as well, one uh, somebody I've completely missed off who's who's come in the last three games is Ryan Gravenberch. The lad looks an absolute unit and a machine, and he's slotted in. He's, and that's what I mean. Alongside Sabozlai, the two of them with McCall's Trank in them has been really, really good the last three weeks. But just to kind of echo Colin, like Liverpool have got all the stats coming for them at the moment. In the Premier League, Salah's played 10 games and in nine of them, he's had attacking returns of either an assist or a goal. But you can actually widen that. Liverpool have played 14 games this season. Uh, sorry, Liverpool have played 16 games in all competitions this season. Salah's had a return in 14 of those games. Yet people, nobody's talking about Salah they, 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 think, they think he's on the decline. Like this lad's absolutely punting them in. He's is scary. Um and, and you know, Darwin Nunes' his stats right now for the minutes he's played is is through the roof. I think he's got five assists. He's he's assisted five of Mo Salah's goals. Um and he's coming on from the second off. He's he's coming on being an impact player. He's got three goals himself. He did really well at the weekend. Jota, like the head as this lad wins for for being only five foot nine is ridiculous. Um, he he's obviously tearing it up. I just think I just think there's so much going well with Liverpool at the moment. Um, I have to keep pinching myself because I kind of expect something from last season to just creep in. And you know, if I'm honest, if I'm truly honest, the weakest part right now is the number six role because we've got McAllister playing there and he's not a number six. And I think we found that out a few weeks ago when you know. Liverpool were not outclassed, but they struggled at times trying to maintain the dominance of the game. But as Colin said, we're not chasing games. We're going to be getting in front. 
that's a big difference compared to last year where we kept going behind. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm absolutely buzzing the way the season's been going. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I, I even think they've got more gear, so could be a could be a, a, a one, you know, a shot for, for the title for sure. But the, the game I want to finish on, uh, Colin, was um, Man City comfortable three 0 win at Old Trafford. Um, I think we again we all predict would have predicted this um, the way that Man United have started the season and Man City go there and, and it feels like I can't I feel like they go there and win every time it was a. Uh, Pep's seventh win at Old Trafford. Um, it's like that's just normal, normal circumstance for them to get a win. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I'll come to you on, on Man City then. Uh, what, what do you think of their performance on, on Sunday? Obviously, Harlan gets a, a, a double there, and Foden gets a, gets a third one, but it, it could have been more. The biggest compliment I, I can give them it was Man City. Yes, Mason, um, you. you it sounds silly. They they were good. They were really good and comfortable. But it, it's these type of games, the big games when Man City turn up, you always feel they could probably go up another year or two, and that's a scary thing. Um, they, they, when they are at their best, they manage to win the games comfortably without overexerting themselves. Um, because we know they keep this, um, you know, this forty percent behind for the last three, four months of the season. They do it every year. Um, but I thought they thought they were really comfortable. Um, here's a stat for you: the last time the Man City got a penalty at Old Trafford, Mason, you and I weren't born, and Jamie <laughs> was mental. Jamie was still stealing car radios. So it was <laughs> April nineteen ninety-two. It was the last time they got a penalty in Old Trafford. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so that's my only start for that. But no, I, I really can't either. Like Man City, they just they they look, you know, at, at their best, they, they are just so comfortable. But my only criticism of them is, is they they're doing this again where they they are only doing it consistently. And I know there's a lot of football we played the first six months of the season, got the cup games in Europe and stuff. This season, I think you've got another three, four teams, or, well, at least another three teams who are looking to go the distance with you. So they do need to get this consistency in quickly. Yeah, d- definitely. And, and, and Jamie, I'll, I'll bring you on to Man United side of things. Um, obviously, we've said, I think, week on week, Ten Hag, the pressure's growing. The, fo- the whole football club, there's, there's a lot of rumours going around. Um, but... The one I'm going to ask you, Bruno Fernandes, and it was where he made the point, and I've been saying it for, for ages. You go back he, to the Liverpool game last season, the 7-0, and he was throwing his hands up in petulance. <laughs> this was yeah. pretty much just as bad as that, in my opinion. It was mm-hmm. one of the worst performances, not only from a you know tactical, but his just whole attitude. He looks, he looks so emotional every decision, and it's not just Sunday. He's been like that all season. And I think it's because he knows he doesn't have... You go back to last season, there was talk about cliques forming with him and Ronaldo and Dalla being the Portuguese contingency. And he doesn't have people like Ronaldo to back him up now. And I think he's kind of feeling the pressure a little bit. Um, the, the the one damning thing I heard today, and it absolutely shocked me, because you would never associate it with Man United. Man United have played 14 games this season across all competitions. They've already lost seven. Yeah. That's mental. Man United are currently sat in 10th in the league. They're probably worthy of the 10th position team right now. They've scored 11 goals in the Premier League only. By this time last season, like Rashford probably had about nine goals himself. It just doesn't seem right. And now you're starting to hear all these little fractions starting to tear away now of people making comments about style of management and style of um, you know interaction. Um, the, one that, the one thing that confused me was that They've been crying out for a left back because of the injuries that they've got. Regulon's sitting on the bench, but he still put Amrabat at left back and then hooked him at half time when he got tackled in and then brought Regulon on. So surely if Regulon can come on at half time, he can come on at foot, you know, to start the game and play a more desired you know, four at the back. You then add that into the fact that they've got thirty six year old Johnny Evans and Raphael Varane sitting on the bench. Now I'm not gonna say Raphael Varane's a, a world beater, but to his title, he is. He's won a World Cup. Like, to stick Johnny Evans, well, what was it I seen? I think it was Man United's two centre-backs were both playing for Leicester three seasons ago. 
like Man United have just come so far away from what we all associate Man United with. You add all that to the complications of Sancho, the fallout with Sancho. Marshall's not getting a game. He's hooking the boy Hoyland after 60 minutes on the last three games. I don't get that. Hoyland was probably arguably their only attacking threat. Again, he's been hooked. Christian Eriksen's been found out a little bit. The, the whole midfield, Mason Mount, the amount of money that guy's been spent. And I don't think he's had one game yet where he's come off with maybe a 7 out of 10. There's just so many problems all over that park for Man United right now, in my opinion. It's a mess. It's, 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 the, the, the whole football club's a yeah. company. It's Colin, what's your, what's your thoughts on this this Man United? I think Jamie makes a, a really good point there, just going through and... Johnny Evans, 38, uh, playing for Man United. He couldn't play for him when he was 24, 25. <laughs> it's bonkers. Yeah, I think we're at the stage with Ten Hag where he's he's making decisions out of desperation rather than than thinking them through. Like I, I couldn't understand why they brought Hoyland off. Um, I, I think you've seen the Manu fans were starting to boo that now, though, aren't yeah. they? They're starting to boo those decisions, which is where that dissent is starting to creep in. Yeah, and Jamie. Um, I'm all too familiar with booing the manager's decisions mm-hmm. um, over the last few weeks. It pains me to say it only ends mm-hmm. one way. Um, we, we said what well, four or five weeks ago that because the chat is he's <clears> one <throat> defeat away from getting a sack, he'd never recover for that, and he, he hasn't recovered. It's not improved. So Jamie said that over the course of the season, it's not as if that's a real poor season. That's that. Out of the last ten games, he's only won five in all competitions. Um, it's, you know, the, the back to the decisions he's making. He's putting Harry Maguire in because of, he's desperate. There's nothing else to do. Bring him back. Bring him back, um, Johnny, Johnny yeah. Evans. I, I just, you know, I can't comprehend that. Why do you have an academy? There would have been better free transfers out there. Um, so it's been like this for too long. I think he's... I think I think his time is up, and I think the the players will benefit more the quicker Ten Hag goes because with the frustration with Ten Hag, you are getting you see the fans more and more frustrated with the likes of Fernandez. He's a well, he's the obvious one, but the players who are there and shouldn't be there as well. I mean, Harry Maguire continue to get flung under the bus. His you know his career will be made better if a new manager comes in and they get a, a clean slate. Because when a new manager comes in, an, an air of patience comes to everybody for a certain amount of time. Um, I, I think it's behind the scenes as well, Colin, because surely Ten Hag's not saying to the recruitment team, the board, whoever, saying, right, we need a centre-half and they're going back to the time. Uh, I can only get you Johnny Evans. Yeah, I can only get you Johnny Evans. Like, like, Mason, here's a question. Here's a question. Yes. How many players? How many players do you think Ten Hag signed while he's been at Man United? Uh, 20, I, I know a lot. A lot last summer. Sixteen. It, but... Sixteen players, and he's only been there a year and a half. Of those sixteen players, four of them have been keepers. Fucking hell! Twenty-five percent. Right, Jack Butland. <laughs> Played for was was on Ten Hag's books. Dubrovka was on Ten Hag's books. They've now brought in Anana, and they brought in um, I think it's a Turkish lad by Linda, yeah, who's the number two. Yeah. You've yeah. you've obviously got to chuck in there the, the loan deals that they've got in as well. Sabitzia, that's a that's a that's a that's a him signing. Val Veghorst was a, was a striker last season, but you look at the names that they brought in. Anthony, that's a Ten Hag signing. You Martinez, Ten Hag signing. Onana, Ten Hag signing. Hoyland, Ten Hag signing. All the major ticket players that they brought. So, so the back in the manager. I get there's an issue with recruitment. 100% agree with that. But there's an issue with the selection, in my opinion. Because you look at, arguably, out of all the names that we've just said, of the people that he's brought in big ticket, arguably, and I'm going to hate saying this, but the lad at centre-back, Martin, has probably been the most consistent. And what I mean by most consistent is he gets a yellow card in the first half and goes off in the second half. But he was part of the World Cup winning, you know, Argentina team last season. Anthony's not worked. The stuff we've seen from Anthony on Sunday was absolutely disgusting, in my opinion. He came on to get sent off. He was fuming. He got outclassed by Doku. And that whole petulance of the hand-slapping just reeked to me. I just... You know, I'd be bailing if one of my players did that. But then you look at, has he improved players? You look at 
Eriksen, Malasia. Malasia is another player that, that was his Dutch left back. Do you get what I mean? This is the bit I'm like, I don't think they can afford not to have him because they've invested so much in him. But I don't think they can afford to continue on the path that they've got. Seven losses already in one season, and we're only in the first day of November. We're not even in November yet. That's, no man new manager, and, and out of all the managers since Fergie left, has never had that kind of a record. I seen one the other day, what was it? Um, man United have equaled the amount since Fergie left. They've equaled the amount of losses at home than the whole of Fergie's 26-year reign. So that tells you how far they've dropped. <clears throat> and I know I always put the boot into Manu all the time, but I, I, I'm not buying it. The whole the Glazers, it's all their issue. I think there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, oh, definitely. And I just for, for Ten Hag, I think when he first went in, I thought when he, in the way he handled the Ronaldo situation, I was like, all right, fair enough. This this guy means business. But since then, he's just had problem after problem with player after player. Yeah. And uh, it just it, there's there's obviously issues there. Do you know what I mean there, there is there is obviously it's clear that it's it going to be a maritime. It was Ibrahimovic, I think, gave an interview a couple of weeks back when he said Ten Hag's never dealt with these kind of characters. He did really well with the Tottenham team, with the with an Ajax team, but they were all young boys. They were all young boys on the on the projection to being great. Man, you don't buy young boys on the projection to be great. They buy. Wildies, or in their opinion, they, they you know people that should be ready made, and I think and I think he is really struggling with that, and I think you could probably use a Sancho one as a complete, you know, as a, as a as a marking point. I appreciate it's obviously he's obviously taking a stance, but there's reports coming out now that Sancho's not even allowed in the canteen. He gets his dinner taken to him in the annex across the road, like a pack lunch. This is how strict he's getting. And this is a bit that surprised me. These, as I said, these are all Chinese whispers that are coming out, but these are only starting to come out now because obviously things aren't going well. And I think somebody said to, somebody was talking to one of the coaching staff who he knows and says, what's it like in the dressing room? It must be absolutely mental continuing losing. And he said, Do you know what? He says, we're not allowed to shout at them. So that paints a picture of what his management style is like in the in the changing room. So if they're losing at half time, he doesn't go in and bollock them. He goes in and tries to man manage them. People please them and talk them and tell them they're wonderful. And and, and that might be wrong and that might be right. My thought process is in that is what do you think fucking Klopp would do at half time? What do you think Pep would do at half time? Like Ten Hag, if he's not doing it to that level, then then there's something fundamentally not great with that. Um, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's. I, I, I said to you earlier. I says I'll be surprised if he sees the season. I think at this rate, I'd be surprised if he's there this time. If he's there next year, going into the new year. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Absolute, absolute mess. But it's funny watching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and City didn't even get out of third gear on Sunday. Let's be honest, they really didn't. Really I mean, they played, they played well, but I mean, they, yeah, they could have easily stepped up. Yeah, I see a video of the uh, Man City fans uh, singing, uh, see how it was going around social media singing this song um, about, about, and I just thought, oh, yeah, man, man, <laughs> an RMS. Um, yeah. But gents, that's uh, that's us for, for tonight. Um, all we have to do is thank you both. So Colin, uh, thanks for tonight, mate. Um, look forward to the fixtures this weekend. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, good speaking to you both as always, and thanks to everybody for listening. Hopefully it's a uh, it's another busy week in all things Premier League. It always is, mate. It always is. And Jamie, as always, thanks for tonight. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, as I said, it's always fun sticking the boots into Chelsea and Man U when I can. Um, however, I'm going to go on record and say I do realise that I've actually just slated Luton and begged up Liverpool and it's probably going to be one each on Sunday in the two o'clock kickoff away to Luton because they're desperate for the points. <laughs> I'm very well prepared for that coming back and bait me in the arse. But uh, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to the Monday Night Football next week, which is Tottenham and, and Chelsea. I kind of fancy Chelsea to get something from it, and it's only because nobody's going to expect them to get anything from it. Um, I kind of think, in desperation, they might get something from it. Um, but Newcastle Arsenal on the Saturday night, um, that's another one. So Newcastle have got something like five, half five kickoffs on the Saturday night. Um, you know, controlled by Saudi TV. There's just like something about that. You know, like, <laughs> you know uh, ten tin foil helmets on. Um, there's something not right there, but hey ho. 
Um, I'm looking forward to this week's fixtures already. Um, and uh, Colin, obviously, we did a lot of work on the Fancy Football League. We managed to remove a lot of the false teams, names. So I know you're going to do a bit of, doing a bit of work on that, aren't you, in the next few days? Yeah, I'll finally announce the manager of the month winners and know that all the fucking <laughs> bots. Um, I was so chuffed, like, because I thought I had a really good week, because I went up about 400 places, and I just realised it's because you, <laughs> you've removed everybody. Um, <laughs> Colin so... goes, thought he went up 400 places. It's because I kicked 400 team names out. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, so... Not fine for that, Jamie. And I um, will get the manager of the month prizes out soon. Lovely, nice one, gents. And uh, listeners, thanks for thanks for listening. As always, make sure you give us a like and subscribe. We will be on next week for more Premier League talk. Take care.